Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Carrie Ann Finelli, and I co chair parent education for the Wilton Youth Council. Welcome to our webinar, The Sex Talk Beyond the Birds and the Bees. This morning, we'll be hearing from Jessica Fian, the Director of Education, Outreach, and Operations at the Rowan Center, a sexual assault resource agency in Stamford. Jessica holds a BA from the University of Rhode Island and an MA in teaching from Sacred Heart University. Jessica was honored by her local police department and sexual assault crisis center for intervening in a sexual assault and potentially saving someone's life. This incident led her to her current position at the Rowan Center. In addition to Jessica, we are joined by Eve Kessler and Carolina Corrigan of SpedNet Wilton, who will be assisting this morning. Thank you, Carolina, for your technical help. Thank you to our co-sponsors, SpedNet Wilton, Wilton SEPTA, which is the Wilton Public Schools Special Education PTA, Weston Youth Services, and special thanks to the Rowan Center for providing Jessica for us this morning. I'll put all the sponsors' websites in the chat, so be sure to visit them for more information. Please note that SpedNet Wilton will be holding a related webinar entitled, The Elephant in the Room, Navigating the Minefield of Sexuality for Kids with Special Needs. Clinical psychologist, Marsha Eckert, will discuss how we can help our kids understand their own sexuality and needs and how to interact safely with peers. The date is Tuesday, April 13th, 10 to 11 a.m. Please see SpedNet Wilton's website for more information and registration. During today's webinar, please enter your questions in the Q&A rather than the chat. You can find the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and we will read questions to Jessica. Before we get started, a reminder that Wilton Youth Council programs are for informational purposes only do not constitute medical advice and are not a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Be mindful that this is an open forum that is being recorded and we can't guarantee confidentiality, so you may not want to reveal any private information. Now we'll get started. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you so much. I am so excited. This is such a big group, so this is going to be fantastic. Um, we are going to do our very best to answer all of the questions that we can today. And if, if there's a time crunch and for whatever reason we're not able to, I will put my email in the chat at the very end and please feel free to reach out to me to, with any questions that we're not able to get to. Um, Carrie Ann mentioned um, that this will be recorded, so you know, be mindful of confidentiality. I also wanna add in that I am a mandated reporter. So that means that I'm required by law to report anything that is suspicion of abuse of a minor, um, someone under the age of 18. So if you are coming to me with a specific um, scenario, just keep in mind that I am a mandated reporter. Um, okay, so we are going to go ahead and get started with the webinar. So first, I want to tell you a little bit about the Rowan Center, just very briefly. We are located in Stamford. We serve the eight towns of Lower Fairfield County, so Wilton, Weston, and Westport down through Greenwich. So in all of those eight towns, we have a 24 hour crisis hotline. Um, that means that anybody can call any time of day, any day of, of the year, and a trained advocate will be on the other end of that call to help work through whatever it is that the person is calling about. We offer free and confidential crisis counseling to victims ages 14 and over, and that's primary and secondary victims. So primary victim is somebody who the violence happened to directly and a secondary victim is anybody indirectly affected that could be a parent a spouse or a partner a sibling a teacher a co-worker again anyone indirectly affected by the violence um, can also get that free confidential counseling we also do advocacy so sometimes the hotline will be a police or hospital accompaniment the three hospitals in our eight towns are norwalk stanford and greenwich Anytime a victim goes into the hospital for sexual assault, the hospital calls the hotline, an advocate goes to the hospital, and we stay with them throughout their entire duration at the hospital. We also do police and court accompaniment as well. 
We have a variety of different support groups. Those are changing often as the needs of the community change. So please check our website if you want information on what our current support groups are. We are also offering all of our su support groups right now virtually. Uh, we are not doing them in person at this time. We are hoping someday that we get back to that. And we do prevention education. So in those eight towns, we are in almost every single elementary, middle school, and high school. The two colleges, NCC and UConn Stanford, we do webinars like this. We do conversations with parents, um, church groups, community centers. We do police department trainings, hospitals, doctor's offices, anywhere. We do sexual harassment in the workplace for corporations, anywhere in those eight towns. If there's any ever anybody who wants a conversation around sexual violence, um, we, we are the experts. And we have age-appropriate conversations across the board. So obviously when we go into a kindergarten or a first grade class that looks a little different than what we do in a fourth grade class an eighth grade class high school college etc so they're all age appropriate and any topic related to sexual violence so we always throw out this take care of yourself reminder in these webinars because we are talking about sexual violence in some regard it can be an uncomfortable sometimes triggering awkward conversation for people so if at any time anything comes up for you, please feel free to take a step away, get a drink, um, take some deep breaths, you know, whatever it is that you need to do to keep yourself safe and come back and join us when you are ready. So in order to understand consent, um, we have to understand boundaries, right? So we're sort of starting at the beginning of this conversation. And this is a starting point. Everything that we're going to go over today is conversations that you can have with your children, right? So I'm really giving you a guide. Everything that I talk about, you can take directly to your children. Please feel free to use this. And everything that I'm talking about is gender inclusive. So whatever types of relationships you have or your children have with, with the outside world, it doesn't matter the gender identity, the gender orientation, the sexual orientation. These are all gender and sexual inclusive um, information. So we're talking about boundaries. We have a boundary is a line we cannot cross, right? So we want to make sure we understand what a boundary is. So when we have this conversation with students, we have them explain what boundaries there are around us. So the walls of a house are a boundary, doors are a boundary, gates and fences. The most obvious ones we have are the lines on some sort of sport field, right? Like a, a field, a court, a rink. We, we have those actual boundaries that we can see. And we talk about when uh, something is crossing a boundary or out of bounds. We sort of, if we're, if we're talking in sports terms, we stop the play, right? And then we're actually going to watch a quick a video later about that, that, that uses a uh, sports reference as uh, when talking about consent. So when we're talking about boundaries, we're talking about two different types. They can be physical and they can be emotional. And it's important for us to recognize boundaries in others so that we can respect them. So you can see here, this hug, how, how consensual does this look on both parts, right? And then we want to be mindful of people's emotional boundaries as well. So this is very important. We want to be able to read nonverbal cues, right? So being able to have a conversation with our children about nonverbal cues is also important. It's not just the physical cues we're looking for, it's nonverbal. Everything that we talk about, we want to model for our children. So if we have children where we do something to them that we know they don't like, we tickle them when we know they hate being tickled, we grab food off their plates when we know that they hate sharing their food, um, they're wearing a baseball hat and we flip it off of their heads. We know they hate that. Or we tussle their hair. We know they, we don't like, they don't like their hair being touched. Anytime we do those types of behaviors, we're teaching that person that their boundaries don't matter. And it's very important for us to model this behavior. So if we want our children to be mindful and respectful of other people's boundaries, then we have to model that behavior and be mindful of their boundaries as well. Only you can decide what your boundaries are. And in the same regard, every individual gets to decide what their boundaries are. 
So this is, there's an activity that we do with the students. We do this in person. It's hard to do virtually, so we've stopped doing it. But as an example, we pick either six or eight students and we have them pair up. And what we do is we have team A and team B. So we ask team A and team B and we have them pair up, right? So there's a team A across from a team B and we have them as far away from each other as they can, provided the space that we're allowed in the classroom. And everyone on team A is going to take a step closer to the people on team B and team B gets to say yes or no to whether or not they can go closer. And this person gets to decide if they want to keep going closer. So they will say, can I take a step closer? This person B gets to say yes or no. They take a step closer. Can I take a step closer? Person B gets to say yes or no. Now, at some point, A may decide they don't want to go closer. And at some point, B may decide they don't want them to come closer. And so at some point, they'll stop the closeness, right? Now, in the classroom, we have people who are like this. We have people who are like this. We have people who are like this. And we have people who are like this. It's across the board. And then we have the students discuss what made you say yes or no. Um, it could be, well, I, I, I'm partnered with my best friend, so I, I, I don't care. I'll give them a hug. Um, they'll say, you know, I, I just, I don't like getting too close to people. It's in my personal space. Um, we talk about if it matters who the person is. Yes, if it were a different person, I might get closer. If it were a different person, I might not get as close. So across this activity, we always have different results and we let the students kind of talk about where their comfort, comfort level was in getting closer or not so much. It's a really good exercise because it, it gets them kind of talking about boundaries that, again, it depends on the person. It may depend on the day. It may depend on the audience, right? There might be two people in there who would be absolutely okay with getting closer, but because they're in front of their classmates, they're not so much. And all of these conversations are important because, again, we want to be mindful of other people's boundaries. We want to pay attention to their nonverbal cues and we want to be respectful of them. And again, we want to model this. We always want to model this. Boundaries are up to each individual to decide for themselves. Boundaries can change person to person and moment to moment. Modeling and talking openly about boundaries and boundary violations sets the precedent for future events. And we want to allow for mistakes while holding people accountable, right? So if somebody goes to take a fry and we say, hey, I really don't, I don't like sharing food, please don't take a fry. We want to give them the opportunity to next time know not to take a fry, right? We don't necessarily want to, um, you know, yell at them and, hey, this is a boundary violation. This is so disrespectful if they don't know what it is. It's a learning curve for everybody. We want to make sure that the conversations are coming from a place of love where we are not shaming or embarrassing. It's not about making the other person wrong. It's about explaining what our comfort level is. I'll pause here just to see if there are any questions. Jessica, yes, we have a question. Sure. The question is related to boundaries for a child on a spectrum who has difficulty with nonverbal cues. How would you explain boundaries to a child? So for children, again, it's leading by example, especially if you have a child. Now, I, children on the spectrum is a little bit outside of my realm, so I'll do the best I can with the information that I have. Um, I would say, again, modeling those behaviors. So if you have a child that's not good at reading nonverbal cues, I would set that child up for success as much as possible. So if they're in a situation, is it possible to explain to the other people, hey, this is what works for my child, right? This is what my child needs in order to understand that there's a boundary violation happening here. So the more people we get involved, I'll give you an example. One of the things that we talk about that's, that is of utmost importance is body autonomy. And so we teach children that their bodies belong to them, they get to make the decisions around it unless an adult really tells them no. And the best example I can use is hugs. We force children to give hugs if they don't want to. So again, we're giving them a message that you get to make the decisions around your body unless I tell you that you can't and you have to hug someone even though you're uncomfortable hugging that person. If we could have a conversation with the other people, hey, my child doesn't like hugs. So do me a favor when you enter the space ask them and we can have this conversation with children as well right it doesn't just have to be the grown-up so the more that we can get everybody involved in the conversation so if you have a four-year-old 
or a five-year-old who does understand nonverbal cues and you can have that conversation to be able to say, listen, if so-and-so hugs you or, or takes something out of your hand and you don't like it, if you could use these words, these are the words that work for my child, right? So we're setting everybody up in the situation for success. One of the key components in this webinar in every conversation we have is empathy, respect, and communication. We are not taught proper communication skills, right? It's not, we don't talk about uncomfortable conversations. If somebody wants to have a talk, we're like, uh-oh, right? The like, we need to talk is like this big thing of anxiety. And people tend to get defensive immediately. So if we can set people up to have conversations that are not aggressive, right? Um, not confrontational, right? It doesn't have to be a confrontation. It can be a conversation. And if we start that with children, as soon as they gain language, we'll give them the tools that they need to not have to worry about it, right? Then it's not so uncomfortable or awkward a conversation as they get older. So again, if we, we're allowing for mistakes while holding people accountable is, is always the mantra. We're coming from a place of love. We never want to shame. If you have a child that's repeatedly, um, repeatedly breaking boundaries of other people, it's explaining to them again why it's important not to do that, right? And, and instilling that sense of empathy, um, which is going to be more challenging with children with those learning disabilities. It doesn't mean that it's impossible, right? It just might take a little bit more work and it might take a little bit more communication with outside people. And that's the, the best answer I can give given my um, lack of expertise around children with special needs. So I hope that's a little bit helpful. So let's, before we talk about the, the way that we want to talk about consent, let's talk about what we've been taught about consent. We've been taught a lot of misconceptions about consent. So what we've been taught is that no means yes. No is really someone playing hard to get. And we teach people that playing hard to get is, is like a fun game, right? That dating is a game. Avoiding or ignoring someone is playing hard to get, or it means yes. Pushing someone away means to try harder. Convincing someone is a yes. We wanna make sure that we, that we understand that we, again, it comes down to this healthy communication, right? Um, and that if someone says no, we're going to take it as, at, at face value, right? No means no. And if someone is playing hard to get, we're not going to try to guess, right? It's not a guessing game. Again, the communication skills that we teach people aren't really conducive to having open, honest, vulnerable conversations, which is really what you end up needing and wanting and having in an adult relationship, right? And it takes us all a really long time to get there. Maybe not all of us. Um, it takes most of us a really long time to get there because we haven't been taught how to openly communicate, right? We've been taught all of these like weird things around consent um, and that it's, you know, it's, it's all about like convincing somebody. This doesn't necessarily have to be around sexual activity, although obviously it's very important to take this into consideration around sexual activity as well. But even in, you know, somebody doesn't want to do a game, a play a game, somebody doesn't want to go shopping, somebody doesn't want to watch this movie. And what we do is we manipulate until we get our way, right? So, oh, please, we give puppy dog eyes. Um, we bribe children with candy. If you do this, you'll get ice cream. If you don't do this, you won't get ice cream. Um, you know, I'll buy you dinner if you do this, drinks on me if you do this. So it's, it's our communication skills have been taught around manipulation to get what we want. And again, we want to model appropriate behavior. So if we want our children to understand that manipulation and coercion is wrong in relationships, then we have to model that it's wrong and not do it ourselves. Right. So a really big piece of this is being the example and the role model, which is a little bit tricky because we've also been taught, right? These behaviors and attitudes and beliefs are sort of hardwired into our brains too. So it's gonna take a little bit of undoing. So the first thing that I, I suggest is that you become aware of your own behaviors and attitudes that might lead into this culture of manipulation and coercion um, because it is, it is all related and connected. what we want to teach around consent is that only yes means yes. Consent exists only when there is a clear, 
active and voluntary yes from all individuals involved. And when we talk to um, students about this, youth about this, it's equal and enthusiastic. Enthusiastic is a really big piece of it. Um, if something is, if it's not enthusiastic, then it's not consensual. Now that doesn't mean that it has to be this like, I'm jumping up and down with excitement, right? But it's not this like shrug, like, okay, I guess so, you know, maybe, fine, right? Those kinds of responses are, are not consent. We wanna make sure it's like, yeah, okay, I'm down. It's also important to note that consent can be given or taken back at any time. It is never implied or assumed, and it has to be given with one's free will. It's in, this is important during sexual activity as well, because if somebody decides in the moment that they've changed their mind about something, then consent has been retracted and we stop what it is we're doing right um that goes that goes with anything um yeah here i'll share my fries with you you know and you're sharing fries with someone and then um you know what there's only seven fries left i want to eat the rest of my, the fries myself that's fine right and again being able to model these behaviors any questions okay remember that consent is active it's based on equal power, it's a choice, and it's an ongoing process. This is a fantastic video that we show um, everywhere we go, parents, youth, and it really is great at setting the example of, of what consent is. If you're still struggling with consent, just imagine instead of initiating sex, you're making them a cup of tea. You say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they go, oh my God, I would love a cup of tea. Thank you. Then you know they want a cup of tea. If you say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they're like, uh, you know, I'm not really sure. Uh, then you could make them a cup of tea or not, but be aware they might not drink it. And if they don't drink it, then, and this is the important part, don't make them drink it. Just because you made it doesn't mean you are entitled to watch them drink it. And if they say no, thank you, then don't make them tea at all. Just don't make them tea. Don't make them drink tea. Don't get annoyed at them for not wanting tea. They just don't want tea, okay? They might say, yes, please, that's kind of you. And then when the tea arrives, they actually don't want the tea at all. Sure, that's kind of annoying as you've gone to all the effort of making the tea, but they remain under no obligation to drink the tea. They did want tea, now they don't. Some people change their mind in the time that it takes to boil the kettle, brew the tea, and add the milk. And it's okay for people to change their mind. And you are still not entitled to watch them drink it. And if they're unconscious, don't make them tea. Unconscious people don't want tea. And they can't answer the question, do you want tea? Because they're unconscious. Okay, maybe they were conscious when you asked them if they wanted tea. And they said yes. But in the time it took you to boil the kettle, brew the tea, and add the milk, they are now unconscious. You should just put the tea down. Make sure the unconscious person is safe. And this is the important part again. Don't make them drink the tea. They said yes then, sure, but unconscious people don't want tea. If someone said yes to tea, started drinking it, and then passed out before they'd finished it, don't keep on pouring it down their throat. Take the tea away. Make sure they're safe, because unconscious people don't want tea. Trust me on this. If someone said yes to tea around your house last Saturday, that doesn't mean they want you to make them tea all the time. They don't want you to come around to their place unexpectedly and make them tea and force them to drink it going, but you wanted tea last week. Or to wake up to find you pouring tea down their throat going, but you wanted tea last night. But if you can understand how completely ludicrous it is to force people to have tea when they don't want tea, and you're able to understand when people don't want tea, then how hard is it to understand it when it comes to sex? Whether it's tea or sex, consent is everything. And on that note, I'm going to go make myself a cup of tea. So part of this webinar is how are you able to talk to your children about, about this, right? About these, these hard conversations. Let's say that you have children or child and it's like a little too late 
to start the conversation, it, it would be way too uncomfortable or awkward for either, either, you know, whoever, you, the child, anyone involved. Showing this video could be a great way to get that conversation started. So all you have to do is say, hey, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to watch this really good video that I saw. It really explains a lot of things that I want to talk to you about. Watch the video for me and let me know when you're done watching it. It's a quick couple minutes and it's, it's great. It really drives the point home and you don't even have to be there. If you feel like you can watch it with your child, great. Um, and then if you feel like you can watch it with your child and talk about it afterwards, great. The, the varying levels of conversation are gonna have to depend on your relationship with your child. And if this is completely new territory, it's going to take a little bit of time to get to a place where you're all comfortable discussing things. It doesn't mean it can't happen. It just means that you may have to start with smaller little pieces like, hey, watch this video alone on your own time. We don't even have to talk about it. Just let me know that you watched it, right? So that could be a beginning point. And then, like I said, depending on the level of communication that's already been there, watch it together or watch it alone and discuss it afterwards, et cetera. So find what fits for your relationship with your children. The other thing is with any child, these conversations, at least, at least until everyone's comfortable with having them, should be with the parent that the child is already most comfortable with having awkward, uncomfortable conversations with. And that may not be you, and that's absolutely okay. What's important is if you have a partner who's discussing this with your child, um, that the partner loops you into the conversation so that you're on the same page. That doesn't mean that there has to be any confident, confidential information given, right? Let's say the child is just a lot more comfortable talking to one parent and, and is giving stuff that they really don't want the other parents to know. We want to be respectful with that trust. And so we only tell the other, uh, other parent what it is that they really need to know so that everyone's on the same page, right? We want to loop everybody in. Jessica, we have a question. Yeah. Uh, age, how old should a child be to watch that video? So again, that's going to depend on your household and the maturity level of your child. We have some schools where we show this video in eighth grade. Um, I would say it's probably pretty rare that we show it in a seventh grade, maybe one or two schools where we show it in seventh grade, but for the most part, this is a ninth grade and up conversation. Um, but again, if you think that if your child is already exhibiting signs of having, you know, an understanding of sex, um, then I would say even seventh or eighth grade, go ahead and show this video. Okay, thank you. And Another question about where do I find the tea video? And I believe the tea video link is going to be available in our resources page on Wilton in the, on the Wilton Youth Council website. We're gonna be posting the recording of this webinar and also a list of resources. And I'm almost certain, I will double check, but I'm almost certain that the tea video is gonna be uh, linked on there for people. If it happens to not be, it's on YouTube and you can just Google consent is like tea. I will let you know that there is a clean version and a dirty version. The dirty version, I think they just use uh, like, like they throw an F-bomb in there once or twice, I think. Um, again, that's your personal choice as a parent, but if you, if you, you'll see that it'll say clean version on it and you can show the clean version and it's the same exact message. They're just, the language is a little bit. Um, heavier in the, um, in the dirty version. Thank you, Jessica. And actually, I just got confirmation that that the clean version link is going to be available on um, WiltonYouth.org on our website on the resources page, so everybody can access that. Yeah. Um, another question about um, self-defense classes for teenage girls um, for someone that might be leaving for college in the fall and you know how 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 can we give some teenage girls some physical tools before they leave for college yeah um so i would say it it could never hurt to have everybody people take a um a self-defense class there's a difference between prevention and risk reduction and self-defense classes would be considered risk reduction because in a dangerous situation, you really just never know, or an unsafe situation, you really just never know how your brain is going to react to that situation. And a very common response for people is to freeze. 
So you, if you want to give your children a, a self-defense class, if you think that that will make them feel better, there are, you know, it does, there are people who say it gives them a sense of empowerment. Um, however, if something happens to them, they do often tend, I mean, we, we live in a society that victim blames anyway, um, but it, it can be difficult because they'll think, well, like I had these tools to protect myself and I didn't. And it can be even more traumatic if the outside perception is the same. So my only, uh, you know, caveat with that is I would say if, if something ends up happening to any of your children, um, that you move away from like what happened, you had the tools to defend yourself. Why didn't you, which I know it can be a very easy thing for us to think. Um, and it can just make the trauma of any type of, you know, victim of, of violence be that, that much more. Um, so I would just be, you know, wary that yes, it could absolutely help. Uh, and it's not a guarantee. It's, it's just like another tool in their pocket to have, you know, that may or they may or may not be able to use. Thank you, Jessica, for that. We have another question before we move on to the next piece of your webinar. Um, what is the normal sexual activity that parents need to be ready for in sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth grade? So I think that also is going to depend on your student and the community that they're in and what's around them um, and your, your particular child and how they feel about it. I don't necessarily know that there's like a normal range and we don't have statistics around that. The only thing I can tell you is that things are happening younger for people, right? So we have a sexting program that we do in ninth grade. We had to create a sexting program for sixth graders um, because there were a couple of schools that were having some, some sexting issues that needed to be addressed. And now it's like a common program that we offer for all sixth graders, sixth grade schools as well. So I can tell you that things are happening younger and younger. Again, if you feel like your child is exposed to conversations around sex, have the conversation. It, it can't, can't do any harm to have the conversation. It could do harm to not have the conversation. Thank you, Jessica. There's, um, I'll also remind our audience that there are resources on sexting that will also be listed on our resource page. Great. Um, and again, you can all, I'll put my email in the chat at the end of this and you'll all be able to reach out to me for additional questions. If you have a specific, you know, if your child is, is doing something um, sexual activity related that you're concerned about, please feel free to reach out to me individually and we can get on the phone and hash out how to have the conversation with that specific child. Okay, so we're going to do an activity. Um, I have four volunteers that I would like to have um, at this point do this activity for the rest of the group. We do this with um, our youth and, and a, you know, like uh, I would say maybe eighth grade and above populations as well. Um, where my four volunteers are going to decide on two pizzas. Um, and they're gonna pick at least two toppings for each pizza. And th what basically they're just gonna have the conversation in front of us on what those two pizzas are going to be. <coughs> so if my four uh, volunteers can just go ahead and start chatting about what the two pizzas are going to be that you're going to order with at least two toppings on each pizza. Oh boy. <laughs> I don't want pineapple. I like pineapple. Oh. Oh, well, but I want mush. I really like mushrooms. I can do mushroom. I love mushrooms. All right. Wait, who? You don't like mushrooms? I like mushrooms. Oh, so mushrooms and. So we do cheese and mushroom. I like tomatoes. Cheese, tomatoes. All right, so cheese and mushroom on one and tomatoes and anchovies. Oh, I hate anchovies. Uh oh. <laughs> no anchovies. Real? No. Are you sure you don't want to just try it? No. I hate anchovies. I'm good. Um, I like pepperoni. Um, pepperoni. I like pepperoni. I don't like Okay. No. Um, got onions. No, I don't like onions. No, I don't like onions. <laughs> that work for me. Oh, uh, two toppings each. What do we have? One pizza with, sorry, I'm trying so to we, think. 
So we have mushrooms and not pineapple. What was it? Mushrooms and I don't remember. Oh boy. Something else besides oh mushrooms, boy. was it? Oh no. It wasn't anchovy. Somebody hated it. Oh. Mushrooms and cheese. And cheese and tomatoes. It was mushrooms and tomatoes. Right. Mushrooms kinda, and tomatoes. Kind of like the pizza that's on the picture there. That's a lot more than one. <laughs> <laughs> that's like anti-past pizza. I know. All right. So mushrooms and cheese on one and tomato and... How about bruschette? Is that called? What is that called? Bruschette. I mean, I like bruschette. Yeah. Okay. All right. So tomatoes and bruschette on the second. Yeah. Okay. We did it. Yay. <laughs> Good job. I know. I'm sorry. I usually have to say, um, I'm really sorry that when we're in person and we do this in classrooms, I'm like, we're not actually ordering pizza. I'm really sorry about this. Um, so the activity, um, any of the volunteers, do you want to just try to guess why uh, I, we did this activity? And I know I'm putting you on the spot right now. So if you don't, I'll give you like five seconds. And if you don't answer, I'll just move on and explain. Is it negotiation? Yeah. Anybody else? Well, it's also about not being pressured, right? To choose what somebody else wants. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. It's really, it's finding common ground on what you all like and agreeing on what works for all of you, right? So when somebody said, I don't like pineapple, nobody was like, well, we're getting pineapple. Um, somebody said, would you be willing to try anchovies? And the person was like, nope, not willing. And then they moved on. Nobody was like, come on, you'll like them. Maybe you'll like them. Come on, try some anchovies, right? Nobody blatantly ignored that and just was like, well, we're getting anchovies. So when we have these conversations, we want conversations around sexual activity to be as normal as deciding on what kind of pizza we're going to order. We want to normalize these conversations. We want to just be able to ask questions. Hey, what do you like? Is this okay? How do you feel about this? Would you be willing to try it? No? Okay. And we move on and we find something that we all agree on. So again, modeling these conversations is being completely normal is going to get our children in the habit of understanding like it's really actually not a big deal right we don't talk about sex as a society it's a taboo subject and so we don't talk about sexual activity right amongst uh particularly youth right for people to be like oh i like this for youth is like mortifying so if we can normalize having these conversations with our children we'll get them to feel like oh it's really not a big deal and it doesn't have to be this robotic, like, can I take your shirt off? Can I unzip your pants, right? It's really just being able to read those cues. Is this enthusiastic between everybody involved? Is everybody, is everybody on board? Um, are there any nonverbal cues that I'm missing? Am I asking questions just as normal as if we were deciding on what pizza we wanted? And so again, if we can just normalize the way we have these conversations, um, we can teach our children to normalize it too. That's great. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, no problem. This is another example of like a, a do we have consent video? No. Oh, sorry. Damn. Here we go. Hi, I'm here and I'm trying to figure out what consent really is and how to get it right. Hey, can I borrow your phone? No. Foiled. Hey, can I have your phone? No. Damn! Hey, give me your phone! Victory. Was that consent? No, that was coercion. Consent must be voluntary. Hmm. Jonathan? Yeah? Hey, can I borrow your phone really fast? I have no phone. Okay, great. How about now? No. Clearly, he was incapacitated and could not give consent. Uh. Hey, uh, can I borrow your phone? <laughs> he didn't say no. Did I get it right? No. Two negatives do not make a positive. The absence of no does not mean yes. <sighs> hey, can I borrow your guys' phones? Yes, sir. Why? What do you want it for? It's okay. Don't worry about it. I'm sure it's fine. Just give it to her.
tell me I'm good. Group phones make things complicated. Looks like the middle person was intimidated. Sorry, no go. Oh. <sighs> Look, can I just have your phone? Uh, yeah. Uh, just no texts or international calls. Are you comfortable with me changing your ringtone? As long as it's not disco. Can I play with your game center? No, my games are sacred to me, but you can update my software. Shazam? Shazam. Oh. Tell me, please. A conscious, voluntary decision without coercion or intimidation with clearly spoken boundaries. Congratulations. Yes. <clears throat> So again, just another example of, you know, it, a no does not mean a yes. If somebody doesn't hear you or is incapacitated, that's not a yes. Um, if somebody is coerced or intimidated, that's not a yes, right? And again, modeling these behaviors when it's not about sexual activity will really get people into the habit of practicing empathy and respect. And then when it is about sexual activity, they'll already have those tools and skills. We also want to hold the appropriate people accountable, which means we don't want to victim blame. So wearing certain clothing is not consent to sexual activity. Nudity is not consent to sexual activity. Accepting a ride home is not consent to sexual activity. Agreeing to some sexual activity is not consent for all sexual activity. Being under the influence of drugs and or alcohol is not consent for sexual activity and walking home alone at night is not consent for sexual activity. So it's also really important for us to be mindful of the messages that we send people, particularly girls around sexual violence. Um, and to be quite honest, it's really all genders because you know, people who identify as male will also think, well, they wore that outfit, they obviously wanted attention or well, they came over to my apartment um, so obviously that meant that we were going to do something, right? And, and unless there's open and clear communication, nobody should be making any assumptions about what anything means, right? There's no hidden meaning. People wear the clothing that they're comfortable wearing. The most common outfit that a victim is wearing when they've been sexually assaulted is jeans and a t-shirt. Um, so people wear certain clothing to make them feel good, right? Not because they're asking to be assaulted. Um, people hang out with people and go to people's parties or, you know, go back to people's apartments with just one person. Um, it doesn't mean that they are necessarily agreeing to sexual activity. And if they get there and decide that they don't want to, they change their mind, that's absolutely okay. Healthy sexuality is understanding the anatomy of the body and how the reproductive system works. So this conversation is beyond the birds and the bees. The birds and the bees conversation is still very important, right? Recognizing components of healthy and unhealthy relationships. We're going to talk about a few of those. Um, the definition of healthy sexuality may change from person to person or relationship to relationship. It's developed over a lifespan. It's not necessarily something that people ever achieve. It's a lifetime endeavor. And it's about having empathy, respect, communication, and non-judgment. And again, if we can model these behaviors, then we instill these, these behaviors and skills into our children. Breaking down a few misconceptions. You can't have sex when you have your period. So these are all misconceptions around sexual activity. You can't have sex when pregnant. Birth control or contraceptives like plan B are forms of abortions. If someone's hymen is broken, it means they have had sex. Larger breasts are linked to greater pleasure. And once someone is erect or aroused, they can't control themselves. So there's a lot of misconceptions, particularly around youth, that they have when it comes to talking about sexual activity. It's important that we help break down these misconceptions. And again, if this is a conversation that's like a little bit too much for you to have with your children, you can send them to the appropriate, um, you know, look online and see if there's videos that they can watch, look for books that they can read. Um, you can start the conversation like with the tea video, short, sweet, easy, simple, and then move on into having longer, deeper conversations. Um, you could even just give them 
like take a picture of this if you want and send it to your children and say, hey, you don't even have to talk to me about this. I just wanted you to know that these are some misconceptions that aren't true. If you have questions, I'm here for you. Um, but you know, just wanted you to know. Right, again, starting simple, quick, because we're not used to having these conversations. And like I said, if you are used to having these conversations with your children, then by all means, you can dig in a little deeper and ask them, which one of those misconceptions did you think was true? Do you wanna talk about it? Are there any questions you wanna ask me? You wanna create a safe space for your children where they don't feel shame, embarrassment. It's not a lecture. Um, we wanna you know, trust them in the decisions that they're making, let them, have their own views and opinions, even if we disagree. And if they're problematic, ask them probing questions. Where did you get this view from? Um, try to give them the opposite side of it, right? Um, so teens and pornography, we have 93% of boys and 62% of girls who are exposed to internet pornography before the age of 18. 79% of accidental exposures to internet porn among kids take place in the home. That can be with like they're watching a video and another video all of a sudden popped up or an ad pops up and the next thing you know, they're watching porn and they didn't mean to. Only 3% of pornogra pornographic websites require age verification. And the average age a child first sees internet pornography is 11. So again, just be mindful of this. Have conversations with your children on what they're seeing. Jessica, we have a question. Sure. Related to this. Yep. Are there any apps are there any apps that you think kids are using that are more likely to normalize sexting and behaviors we don't want kids to engage in? I would say it's, yes, it's not necessarily the apps, it's the people on the apps. So the things that they're seeing on TikTok, on YouTube, on Instagram, right? Because now children younger and younger have access to see it all, um, they, they're going to model behaviors after people that you may not necessarily want them to model behaviors after. That's one of the reasons why these conversations are so important and understanding the exposure rates. Um, you know, if you have an 11 year old who has a phone that has open access to the internet or some sort of tablet, they, they have, they're more likely to be able to fall upon this. So that's why these questions are, sorry, these conversations are so important because it really, they have, they, they're exposed to it in almost every app that they can, they can use. Um, you know, Snapchat, um, TikTok, Instagram. Um, and, and one thing that we don't ever suggest is spying on your children. Um, we have had, you know, parents have certain guidelines that they follow. So they're allowed to do random phone checks on their kids without their kids knowing. So they can say, hey, random phone check, grab the phone. Um, and look through it with their kid. They, you know, parents have said that they have like after 8 p.m., all the phones go into one basket, no one uses them. I would suggest that if you have a child using a tablet all of the time, that if they're in their room, the door is open or they, they use it in front of you, they're not closed off in their bedrooms. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of issues around privacy invasion with youth. Um, and there are things that you should be aware of that are out there that they are exposed to. There are, you know, there are, unfortunately, again, we live in a world where risk reduction is necessary. So I would suggest you familiarize yourselves with the apps that they are using, get on them yourselves, um, you know, see what they're about, check out the privacy settings on your children's phone, you know, particularly if they're younger. Um, I would say definitely be aware of the apps and what they are using for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So when an adolescent compulsively views pornography, their brain chemistry can become shaped around the attitudes and situations that they watch. And pornography paints an unrealistic picture of sexuality and relationships that can create an expectation for real life experiences that will never be fulfilled. And when we interview youth, we really do find that they have this idea that sexual activity is what they see in porn. So it's often that if it's a heterosexual couple that they see um, that the male is dominating, that the female is submissive, right? Um, that it's a violent act, um, that there's no communication or conversation going on. Um, so it is important if your child is being exposed to porn that they understand that that's not a realistic portrayal of what consensual sexual activity looks like between people. Uh, and again, being comfortable with having those conversations. 
if you've noticed that sometimes your child's thinking and behavior seems quite mature, but at other times your child seems to behave or think in an illogical, impulsive, or emotional way, the back to front development of the brain explains these shifts and changes. Teenagers are working with brains that are still under construction, right? So we know that their brains aren't fully developed until they're upwards of 25 years old. Children's brains have a massive growth spurt when they're very young. By the time they're six, their brains are already about 90 to 95% of adult size. And the brain then just does all remodeling. And, you know, that's where all the nerve endings finalize before it can function as an adult brain. The brain remodeling happens intensively during adolescence and continues into your child's mid-20s. So building a healthy teenage brain the combination of your child's unique brain and environment influences the way your child acts, thinks, and feels. For example, your child's preferred activities and skills might become hardwired in the brain. And this is one of the reasons why modeling this behavior is so important, particularly when they're younger. So while the child's brain is developing, they might take more risks or choose higher risk activities. They may express more and stronger emotions and they may make impulsive decisions. So just these are all normal things that they're going through. Healthy relationships bring out the best in you and make you feel good about yourself. A healthy relationship does not mean a perfect relationship and no one is healthy 100% of the time, but the signs below are behaviors you should, you should strive for in all of your relationships. Healthy relationships manifest themselves as healthy communication, and another important part of healthy relationship is loving yourself. And so we're going to go over a couple of characteristics and behaviors of a healthy relationship and unhealthy relationship so that we can see the difference between those components. And again, modeling these behaviors is incredibly important. So a few signs of a healthy relationship are trust, honesty, respect, equality, kindness, and having healthy conflict. So I would say the example of that pizza conversation was a healthy conflict conversation. And now maybe somebody would have been like, oh man, but we, we never get anchovies and I really want anchovies. And being able to work through that conflict so that everybody comes out feeling okay is important. Um, and again, these all play into sexual activity as well, right? We wanna trust the partner that we're with to have, we wanna feel safe, right? That they have our best needs in mind that they are honest with us, that they aren't, you know, shaming us or, or taking advantage of us, um, that they are respectful of our boundaries, right? That there's equality, so no one feels coerced or manipulated into doing anything. Um, and of course, that they are kind, right? So particularly um, around sexual activity, but also we wanna model this behavior just in everyday life as well and teach them that these are really important components of a healthy relationship and if they feel that any of these are missing that it is really worth having the conversation around what kind of a relationship they are in and some signs of an unhealthy relationship would be manipulation sabotage guilting or deflecting responsibility and again if we're talking about sexual activity manipulating them into doing something they don't want to do, sabotaging them, like, you know, sharing photos of them that were taken confidentiality in confidentiality, um, you know, secretly recording activity, um, and then guilting, again, goes along with the manipulation um, and deflecting responsibility. If something happened that someone feels like was uncomfortable and the person's not taking ownership of it, right, that's a real sign of, of an unhealthy relationship. So we all want to be able to hold one another accountable and have the self-awareness to admit when we've made a mistake. Um, I'm going to skip this video because we're lacking in time and I wanna be able to get through the rest, but I will include, I'll make sure that this is included um, in, um, in the resource page. And then what I'd like you to do for these scenarios is take a picture of this screen um, these are some examples that you can go, go through with yourself, go through with a partner or a friend. Um, if these situations were happening to either your own children or somebody that you know and love and care about, how would you react? What would be these conversations? Do you think that these are healthy or unhealthy and why? Um, are there red flags? And if they are, what are they for you? So again, these are like practice scenarios that you can go through. You can even go through these with your children, right? So a couple has an agreement that they won't put passwords on their phones and can check each other's texts and social media accounts whenever they feel like it. 
So have that conversation with your child. What do you think? Is it healthy? Is it not? Talk about why it is or isn't. Um, and you can do the same for all, all of these scenarios. These are really good ways just to, again, get yourself comfortable with how would you react? How would you feel? And then you can share these examples with your children. And these could be, again, really good ways to start the conversation. If you are not in the habit of having these conversations with your children, um, you can, you know, start with these scenarios. Some quick statistics of teen dating violence. One in three teens ages 14 to 20 have been victims of dating violence and about the same number say they have committed relationship violence themselves. In 2011, 9% of high school students reported being hit, slapped, or physically hurt on purpose by their partner. And 43% of college women report experiencing violent and abusive dating behaviors, including physical and sexual abuse or threats of physical violence. Over 80% of sexual assault, assault victims know their perpetrator and on college campuses, it's over 90%. So it really is important for us to know that a lot of these behaviors are normalized as as a society, right? And so again, that's why modeling these behaviors are so important. We really wanna break the cycle of manipulating someone to do something or guilting someone to do something is normal, that jealousy is normal, right? We really wanna talk about why those should not be normal and why they're actually unhealthy and problematic in relationships. Um, the other important thing to know about this too is that we're talking about people who know each other. Right, so there's also this misconception around sexual violence that it's stranger danger. And yes, that does happen. Um, but as you can see here, over 80% of sexual assault victims know their perpetrator and on college campuses, it's over 90%. So it's really the people that we know and love and trust who are committing these crimes. And that's why it's important again, to have these conversations with everybody. Um, this is not, you know, how do we protect victims from, from being victimized? It's how do we, get people to not perpetrate violent behaviors, which is why modeling this is so important. Jessica, we have a question. Yeah. Um, when kids are in relationships, <clears throat> excuse me, and they start thinking about wanting more mature physical touching, besides talking to their parents, should they be starting relationships with gynecologists or other professionals, um, and what would you recommend for boys? Um, yeah, so really quickly, I do just want to acknowledge that it is 11 o'clock. Um, so if you are able to stay on to hear the rest of this, that would be great. I, I'm going to guess that we have about five to 10 minutes left. Um, and if you have to go, it is recorded and you'll be able to see it later. But I did just want to at least acknowledge that it is 11 o'clock. Um, yeah, so that sort of goes back to what I was saying with if you have a parent that's more comfortable um, you know, or, or a child that's more comfortable with one parent over the other. We talk about trusted adults um, with our elementary age children, and it's very important for them to be able to choose their trusted adults. It doesn't work if we're like, oh, I'm your trusted adult, come to me, because we may not be. And so we really want to be okay with not being that go-to person. What's more important is that our children feel like they have somebody who they are comfortable talking about talking about this stuff with. So if you feel like your children are not, you're not the trusted adult and they are not comfortable, is there a family member that they might be willing to talk to? Is there a guidance counselor at school that they would talk to? Would going to a gynecologist make them feel better? And I think it's really asking the children um, and having that conversation. Uh, you can also say um, something like, listen, I'm I you know, know this is, this is a hard conversation for us to have, but I wanna make sure you're safe. So here is a list of gynecologists that our insurance covers. If you wanna call a couple of them and make an appointment, let me know. Or if you want me to call, do your research, you know, or I'll do it, like give them those options, right? Again, we wanna normalize these conversations. So the more comfortable we are with having them, the more our children will be. So knowing your child, you can either say, hey, what do you think about going to the gynecologist? Or here's a list, pick, I'll make the appointment or make the appointment, I'll take you and drop you off, no questions asked. Um, so again, finding the comfort level that you have with your children. And for boys, I would say it could be the same thing. Do they have a primary care physician? Um, is it still their pediatrician? That's fine too, right? Is there a guidance counselor? 
um, a coach, a family member. I mean, the same thing can go for any gender, just finding that person that they uh, feel okay having that conversation with. And you can, again, give them the options like, hey, if, if you're comfortable talking to your doctor about this kind of stuff, I'll mention to the doctor to bring it up to you, right? Because you may have a a 15 or a 16 or an 18 or a 19 year old who wants to talk to their doctor about it would feel comfortable, but doesn't know how to bring it up. And so you can say, look, you pick the person, I'll let them know and they'll know to bring it up with you. Um, or what are some questions that you have, write them down on a piece of paper and I'll have the doctor answer them for you, right? So again, it's really like just finding what fits for everybody so that everybody is comfortable. And, and, and the more you get comfortable with having that conversation, um, the more they'll get comfortable. Thank you, Jessica. That's a lot of good information. Sure. Very, thanks. We yeah. have a few questions. Um, however, I know you wanna get through your slides. So maybe I'll hold those to the end. Is that best right now? Yeah, let's try to get through a little bit more. And then if people are able to stay on, um, you know what, let me put my, um, let me just take a quick second to put my email in the chat so that people have it in case you want to reach out to me and I can answer your question and get back to you. So okay. that's my email in the chat. Um, yeah, so I'll just go through a little bit more. And then, like I said, if you're able to stay on for questions, I can stay on after. Thank you. Yeah. So how do we have these conversations with our children? And we've sort of gone over this already a little bit, but we want to start quick with quick, small conversations that last a few minutes. Um, starting in the car is a really great way to have these conversations. If it's a quick car ride, um, or you know, even if you wait until the last like 10, 15 minutes of the car ride or the last five minutes, you're, you're concentrating on driving, your child can look out the window, they can roll their eyes, they can blush and no, one, no one's the wiser. And again, just quick, small conversations that last a few minutes. Model the behaviors and attitudes you wanna see in your children. This is huge, huge. Practice with a friend, a partner or a spouse or in front of the mirror to get comfortable. In the mirror is great too, because then you can sort of see what your facial expressions are um, and how you're reacting to things and, and sort of like attune those to the conversation. Be clear and concise and ask questions. Let them lead the conversation. Stay away from shaming, lecturing, and or embarrassing. Create a safe, judgment-free environment where children know they can turn to you for help. The other thing that I wanna add too is that we, we live in a heteronormative society. So we tend to just assume that our children, our boys are gonna grow up and marry girls and our girls are gonna grow up and marry boys. And we want to also, when we're creating a safe, judgment-free environment, we want to give our children the space to be who they are, to identify the, with the gender that they identify with and to pick the partners that they want to pick that may not necessarily align with the, the societal standards. So, you know, also keep in mind that, you know, you don't necessarily want to ask your, your child who identifies as a girl, like if they've ever hooked up with any boys right? Or if they're looking to, or if they have a boyfriend, right? You want to make sure that you're giving them the opportunity to share that it might not be a boyfriend and then that's, that's okay, right? Uh, and do your research. So again, look into the app, like look into TikTok. What is it? Look into Instagram, check out what a Finstagram is, right? So just get yourself familiar with the apps that people are using. Um, what is Snapchat? Uh, what is Roblox, right? Like download the video games that people are playing and, and again, familiarize yourself with them so that you know what's out there and so that you have an awareness. And there are two TED Talks on another slide that I'll show in a moment that I want, I really encourage everybody want, to watch. They're um, for you just to get a little bit more um, knowledge and information around sexual violence and the way we view it as a society. Um, so this is the sports analogy reference that I talked about in the beginning of the webinar. It's a phenomenal way to start the conversation again. So we'll watch this um, quickly now. It's quick. Any game we watch on TV, right? They, they run, toss, wrestle, chase you know, until someone gets hurt or until someone calls time out. Then the game stops. No matter how much fun they're having, everything stops. 
That's consent. I thought we were just having burgers. Yeah, well, I thought talking was just talking, but you and I both know that's not the same thing anymore, so... Look, you pay attention to the girl you're with, right? You, you, you need to care about her feelings and her, her joy at, at least as much as you care about your own. Okay, okay. And she gets to change her mind at any time. I mean, if she says stop or if she stops having fun, you, you just plain stop. Time out. Game over. No. You in the cold. Being with someone you like is it's nothing like it. And I want you to be safe and happy, but that only happens if she is too. Okay. Right, say it. Say it. Whatever's waiting. If she stops having fun, just plain stop. Time out. Game over. Always. Go on. Pass those fries and tell me what this Kelly is like. So that video is a minute and 33 seconds long. So again, quick, easy. You can show it to your kids if you feel like it's not something that you're quite at that place yet where you can talk about it with them yourself. Um, and it really, right, it just really explains it in a quick minute and a half. So you, again, you can take a picture of this screen. These are just more examples for you to be able to go over how would you react in this situation? Um, one of the things that we always say is if you are, you know, if you are approaching another parent about something, approach them the same way you would like to be approached, right? So again, we want to, we want to be compassionate. We want to come from a place of love. At the end of the day, we want to keep our children safe. And so we want to be able to have um, healthy communication with everybody. Um, and so if, again, if you're approaching a parent, just approach them the same way that you would want to be approached. So, um, you know, like I said, take a picture of this screen and just discuss with a friend or your spouse or uh, out loud to yourself, how would you react to these situations? What would you do? What would that conversation look like for you? So these are the additional resources. I'm going to put them um, in the chat for you, but this one is, they're both TED Talks and it's um, Peggy Orenstein, what young women believe about their own sexual pleasure. And then this one is Alexis Jones, redefining manhood, one locker room talk at a time. And they're both really great, just additional information on sexual violence, um, you know, uh, what it looks like as a society, how we address it and talk about it as a society and could give you just some additional information to have for yourself in, in just in going into having these conversations with your children. So I, I'll put those um, in the chat. And um, that is all we have. If you have any additional questions or you need any more support, you can look up information at therowancenter.org. Um, our, our social media handles are at the Rowan Center. You can always call the hotline. If you want to ask a question anonymously, you can call the hotline and talk to an advocate. Um, and again, you have my email in the chat. And I am more than happy to stay on now and answer some questions. Jessica, thank you so much. I think um, what we'll do is for those of you that have to go, I'm going to just say a few words and wrap up in a minute. Um, those of you who asked questions that weren't answered, if you would, are able to stay on a few more minutes, I will get to those um, and I will ask those live with Jessica in just a few minutes. Um, so in conclusion, thank you to Jessica for all this wealth of information. I think it was fantastic. We learned so much. The videos were super I think I will never think about drinking tea the same way again. Um, I love tea, um, but thank you all who um, watched and submitted questions. Um, and to all of you in the audience, please complete our brief program evaluation that I posted in the chat. You can copy and paste the link from the chat. It's very quick, ask a few questions. We'd love to hear your input about our webinar. We invite you to re-watch the webinar with your tween and teen as a way to get your talks going at home. So please do this. It will be posted on both the Wilton Youth Council and SpedNet's websites. 
And as I said before, we're also gonna be posting a list of additional resources for you related to this topic. Um, so goodbye to all of you that have to leave. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, and- um, so, so much. Oh, so um, someone just said, I wish we had a Rowan Center in the quiet corner of Northeastern Connecticut. There is a member center for every town in Connecticut. If you wanna look up, um, it's the Connecticut Alliance to End Sexual Violence. I'll put that in the chat. Um, the Connecticut Alliance to End Sexual Violence. And you will be able to look up, go to their center map. And there is a member center in every uh, town, for every town. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. That's really yeah, helpful. Sure. Great, okay. I'm gonna just take a look at these questions that we still have remaining. Give me a second. Um, okay, so we have a question about things on Netflix and how Bridgerton, Ginny and Georgia um, are showing much more than maybe shows that some of us watched when we were younger as teens. Um, how do you start the conversation with your kids about some of the content, I guess, on those shows. Yeah. Um, so it's so interesting because Bridgerton actually has a scene where there's basically a, a, a rape that takes place. Um, and I don't, I'm sorry, this is going to be a spoiler for people who haven't yet seen the show. Um, it is a good show. I really did enjoy watching it, but there's a scene where um, I forget their names, but the main characters, the wife um, doesn't get off the husband, right? Um, and everyone sort of watches that without any sort of reaction. And it's just interesting because had it been reversed, you know, there would have been a, a lot of backlash around that. So I really think that starting the conversation has to come from where you're comfortable. So talking about shows may not necessarily be where you're comfortable starting the conversation. Maybe you need to start the conversation somewhere else. Maybe it's by showing the TV video. Maybe it's just by having a conversation with your child where you're like, hey, we never really talk about this and it's important that we do. Do you have any questions for me? Um, and then it's sort of like, again, by modeling behavior, by becoming uh, aware of your own behaviors and to be quite honest, the problematic behaviors that we have, um, because we all exhibit them, being mindful to those and starting to correct those is where I would suggest you start. So even just with like, hey, I know in the past, I've just willingly grabbed food off your plate. I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm going to ask because it's important for me to ask and make sure you're okay with it. Um, so just again, being mindful of the behaviors that we exhibit that uh, are non-consensual and get and start the conversation there. And then you can say, I know you're watching this show. How do you feel about the relationships in it? right there's a character in that show who does not want to go along with the societal standards um and she sort of just gets like shoved along into it right like it's kind of expected no one really addresses until the very 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 end at like the last second where she's like kind of given an out but building up to that nobody really recognizes that she's not about these societal standards right um and I, and I see that there's a question in the chat that this kind of ties into what resources are there for boys to help them be okay with not wanting sex like it's built up to be because boys say no too, right? And so really this conversation is about setting our children up to understand that there's problematic situations out there in the world. That doesn't mean that it's okay for us to exhibit those same behaviors. So we can watch a movie, I can watch a movie that has um, gun violence in it, right? That, I mean, a lot of the movies that we and shows that we watch are filled with violence, whether it's sexual violence or physical violence or gun violence or whatever it is, right? We like that kind of like drama. And I can watch that show and know that those behaviors are not okay. It's a little bit different with sexual activity because those nuances that, that it involves have been sort of characterized as okay our whole lives, right? This manipulation, this coercion, um, have been okay. And so it's important for us to have the conversation that those those behaviors are not okay. It's not okay to coerce someone or convince someone to do something that they're not okay with doing. And when we're talking about sexual activity, it's a crime, right? The end result is that we've committed a crime, we've committed sexual assault. 
Um, but we, if we're talking about sexual assault, we're too late to the conversation. That's, that's the most extreme rape and sexual assault are the most extreme sexual violence acts that can happen. We want to start that conversation way, way, way before that, when we're talking about empathy, respect, and boundaries. And so talking about those TV shows and, and pointing out those problematic behaviors and discussing why they're problematic and how would you feel, um, you know, that, that empathy plug of like, how would you feel if that was your sister or your mom or your brother, right? Or your dad, like, how would you feel if that was you? How would, you know, everybody knows what it, feel, what it feels like to not want to have to do something. Everybody knows what it feels like to sort of be convinced to do something, right? Um, and we all agree that we don't like the way it feels and yet we still do those behaviors to others. So again, if we can make the conversations not necessarily about sexual activity and about empathy and respect across the board all of the time, then when it comes to sexual activity, we've already got it. We're already in the habit of it. That makes sense. Thank you, Jessica. I, I have a quick announcement again. I just wanna remind folks um, that a related webinar is gonna be available through SpedNet Wilton called The Elephant in the Room, Navigating Minefield, the Minefield of Sexuality for Kids with Special Needs. Clinical psychologist, Marsha Eckert will be discussing how to help kids understand their own sexuality and needs and how to interact safely with their peers. So the date for that is April 13th, 10 to 11. And remember to sign up on SpedNet Wilton's website um, also to get more information about it and also to register for that. I just want to remind people that that's related. Um, you know, we may have parents listening right now who may really be helped by an additional webinar specifically for kids um, with special needs. Um, a few more questions, Jessica, if you don't mind. No. Um, a question about hookup culture and does it undermine developing any kind of healthy relationships among college kids? So I would say it depends on why the, the people are hooking up, right? This, so this is, again, going to be an individual conversation. Um, we tend to view um, sexual activity as sort of like a, a social status, right? Um, and there can be, there's a lot of unhealthy um, conceptions that we have around sexual activity. So it's considered like a feat, right? The more people that you've hooked up with or slept with is like kind of like gives you that social status, right? Although for some genders, it could be the opposite. Um, and so it's, I think it's important to discuss again with your specific children um, why, why this behavior is happening or what, when it's healthy and when it isn't, right? So if you have children who are sexually active because of social status. So again, going back to that, um, the, the person in the chat who asked about, you know, the boys and how boys say no to this, that second, um, this, This Alexis Jones redefining manhood one locker room talk at a time. I would suggest you watch that to get a little insight because one of the things that she talks about is she's in this locker room with these football players, and one of them says something to the effect of like sleeping with girls is is hot or something like that or like it's what you're supposed to do. And she shoots back with says who, and he's kind of like left like I don't know like says people but like who said that that was a cool thing to do right and so it's really teaching people to be able to think for themselves around this this topic that you who are you trying to prove yourself to and who are the people out there that said that this was quote unquote cool right and being able to make those decisions for yourself so again if you have somebody who is hooking up with partners because it's, it's making them feel good about themselves that's unhealthy if you have somebody who is experimenting and who is safe, um, you know, that that could be a different conversation, right, with your children. And it's got to be, again, your comfort level and your child and, and explaining those risk factors as well, right? So we want to explain, um, you know, using contraception, um, making sure activity is consensual, the risk of STDs, um, right? So we do want to explain all of the risk factors that come with those behaviors, pregnancy, um, and make sure our children are just really set up for the most successful encounters that we can give them. Thank you. 
I have a few questions on here. One about um, just some tech aspects of the of the webinar. Can you share the link to the short clip and the TED Talk links? Um, What's the short clip? Is that the grades? Um, I'm not sure which clip it's being is being referred to in this question. Okay, um, so I just I stopped sharing my screen because it'll be easier for me to get those links of the webinar. Okay. I have a feeling it, it may be the it may be the short clip toward the end of the webinar with the the man and his son. I have oh, a yeah, that's from Grey's Anatomy. So here I'm putting in the chat right now. That's the Peggy Orenstein. That's a really good one too. And these are both I think they're both about 15 minutes long. Okay. So they're not too they're not too bad. And then this is the Alexis Jones one. Thank you. And then let me see if I can get yeah, this one. I'll just quickly look up the link for everybody. Um, yeah, is there another question while I do this? Um, there is a question about showing your graphic organizer screen again, which I think would possibly means your the beginning of your webinar that shows all the bubbles, perhaps. Um, and then we have, I'm gonna to go to two questions that, well, one question that'll be kind of a short answer. Can kids call the Rowan Center or is that just for parents? Um, so I, I would say it's probably best for um, children ages 14 and over because that's the group that we um, serve. Anyone under the age of 14, we would re refer to like a child guidance center type place. Um, however, if it's a general question about something and there's like a 12 or a 13 year old, as long as it's, you know, um, not anything that would be like an inappropriate question, um, you know, I think our advocates would feel okay answering it, but it's really 14 and over. Okay, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And a final question about before kids are exposed to porn, um, how can parents talk to them so they to, to help them understand that it's not normal, not healthy? Before they're exposed to it? Yes. Um, I would say having it so so I I would say probably talking to them about the birds and the bees, having a conversation of what sexual activity looks like, um, and maybe reading some books. There are some really good books. Um, that are geared towards children on this topic or even giving them their own book, right? Like if they're over the age of like 12 or 13 where they can take their own book and read it, I would say give them a book to read because that will give them, you know, most of those books are written by like physicians or pediatricians or child psychologists. So it'll give them the healthiest viewpoint of it. And then I would say, you know, just explain to them that porn is not a realistic, um, a realistic depiction of sex. And there are a lot of articles out there on, you know, like I, I've read a lot of articles from youth point of view on how it really is misleading that they thought that from watching porn that that's how they were supposed to act in sexual activities. And so you can give if you think that it's age appropriate for them to actually read those testimonials, those could be really helpful too. So I would say just, you know, get anything any with any subject anything that a parent doesn't feel quite educated on to look it up there's so much information on the internet you, you just as a parent you can be a bit more diligent in making sure that it's accurate and from a trusted source right whereas your children may just google and read the first thing and who knows who wrote that um so just, yeah, yeah that's a great that's a great point i have a related question here about whether you have a favorite book for teenage boys um, I don't have a specific book in mind for teenage boys. I can, um, look into it and get back to that parent if they'd like. Okay. And I, I cannot right now find this link to the, um, 
to the Gray's Anatomy, I will look it up and, and give it back, you know, put it in a, for you to put in the resources, I'll, I'll get in touch with you, but I will put back up the, the top screen for whoever it was who um, requested that. Thank you. And I'll just remind everyone that's still listening that, that that the webinar, all of this is being recorded. So you will be able to access those videos through the recording that will be posted um, on Wilton Youth Council's website and also SpedNet's website, which you can find those web addresses in the chat. So you can go back and rewatch and, and pick out, you know, certain parts to, to uh, find again. Um, a few more questions, and, and then I think we're going to be wrapping up as we're getting on to 1130, but we so appreciate everyone's enthusiasm. Um, for a nine-year-old, is it too young to have the talk? So again, um, I would say it really depends on your, um, on your personal, um, on, on your child. Um, I want to say I might have been around nine or 10. I, so I needed to, I was very nervous about my mom going into the hospital for a medical procedure. And as a result of my anxiety around that, she ended up talking to me about, you know, having this conversation around, around sex. Um, and I had to have been around nine or 10. Now, I don't know how much of it I really actually understood. Um, but I, to be honest, my mom has always been one of those parents who's like, hey, if you ask me a question, I'm going to tell you. Um, she's she's always been pretty good at at being. I mean, if she at least appeared to be comfortable. I don't actually know what was going on inside. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, oh, here. Uh, let me put this in the. We found the Grey's Anatomy clip. Thank you for doing that. Here we go. Awesome. Um, so I would say it really depends on your child. If you feel like your child is ready to understand and handle it, or something's come up. That's the other thing is just going off of my mom as an example, if your child asks you something, answer honestly, let them, you know what I mean? Like they're asking for a reason. And if you brush them off, they're going to go look for that answer somewhere else. And it, it's going to be either from their peers or from the internet. And, and then you don't necessarily get to, um, to tweak the information for them the way that you would like them to know, because there could be something your nine-year-old is asking or you want to share with your nine-year-old. And if you're the source of information, you get to decide what to tell them and what not to tell them. And if they feel like you are skirting around the question or don't want to answer it, they're going to go somewhere else for the information. And then you don't have control over what they, they see or read. So I would say being as open and honest with your children um, and making it age appropriate um, it's not so much the age that matters. It's that is it an age appropriate conversation for them? So even if it's about sexual activity, you can still make it age appropriate. And are you just answering the questions that they have? So if you think that there's a reason why you want to have a conversation with your nine-year-old, what I might suggest is that you ask your nine-year-old, what do you want to know? So that you're giving them the information that they're asking and not necessarily giving them more information than you might have needed to. That's a great tip. That's really great. Thanks, Jessica. Very helpful. Um, one, last, <clears throat> one last question and then we'll wrap up. Um, is there any soft porn that actually teaches what a healthy relationship porn should look like? That's a good question. I, I, I don't really know. Um, what I would suggest you do is, is research some porn to see if there is. I mean, so I was going to say that there are videos out there. Um, like, for example, I know they show like the miracle of birth. Um, I, I remember being traumatized by watching that in fifth grade. Um, I don't even know if they still show it, but there are videos that are more educationally based, right? So it may not even necessarily be um, like a soft porn, but it might just be something out there that's a bit more educational. What I might suggest you do is start with some books first because the visuals in books can be really helpful. Um, and, and then I would suggest, you know, maybe do some research on some soft porn yourself. If you feel like you would be comfortable doing that and sharing those videos with your children, that could be a really good way to be like, look, this is a bit more realistic because we know they're going to be exposed to pornography that's not realistic. And so it's not a terrible idea to show them look, this is a little bit more what it looks like, right? 
Um, even if there's a movie scene, we know that there are a lot of movies that show really passionate, um, loving scenes of sexual activity. And so if you have a movie where there's a specific scene that shows something um, that's, a, you know, just a little bit more of, of like caring um, and, and a loving way of depicting sexual activity, you could certainly show something like that. That's a creative solution. <laughs> that's great, Jessica. Thank you. Well, I, I'm just going to I think that we will wrap up again. Thank you so much to Jessica for hanging on with us, answering all of our questions. Um, meant and to start my video. To the participants who hung in there as well. <laughs> yes, and thank you to all of you who hung in um, and and stayed with us and and uh, yes, just took you. all this great. We're, we're so appreciative, Jessica. It was a wealth of knowledge and really, really so interesting place for us to teach consent and healthy relationships. So thank you. Um, I just want to remind parents again to check our, our website, wiltonyouth.org, for more information. Um, we will add as much as we can uh, the video links, the uh, book resources, a lot of people asking about books for boys. Um, so we'll, we'll try to get some of those up in our resource page as well. Um, so I think that about covers it. So we'll be ending the webinar now. Thanks again for joining us, everyone. Have a great day.